OK, it's the last question of the uh, problem solving portion of, of this lecture. And this time, this question, I want to kill two birds with one stone. Right? Uh, for those of you who are non-English speakers, that's an expression. It means to do two things by doing one thing. Uh, for example, uh, you repay a debt, so you're doing two things in effect. Uh, you, you're paying the debt, so, so you no longer feel in debt yourself, and you make the other person happy. Right? So you're, you're doing like two things at once. And here, um, I will introduce you to a new concept, a new idea in group theory, finite group theory, that, uh, that's interesting in its own right. It's an interesting example of proving that something is a subgroup, right? That's, that's what this whole lecture is about, subgroups. But uh, this concept, uh, I, in later lectures, um, and in later courses, particularly in later courses at, at higher level, at, at graduate level, this concept you will see that I'm about to introduce uh, plays a very important role in, in higher level uh, finite group theory. So I'm introducing you to it now, and you will come across it later, especially if, you're, uh, if you want to take these finite group theory lectures to, to higher levels. And I, I'm planning to go to very high levels in uh, finite group theory, because it's so fascinating in its own right. And also, uh, my deep suspicion, there are a lot of other people as well, think that uh, finite group theory especially in, in a technical area known as finite simple groups. Now, they're not simple at all. They're not simple in the sense of easy to understand. They're simple in the sense that they, can, they cannot be broken down further. They cannot be decomposed any, uh, any further. And the largest of those so-called simple groups is called the monster. And it really is monstrous because the size of that group is of the order, you know, the order of the group, finite group, is something like, I think, uh, from memory, 10 to the power of 50, some, something like that, so some humongous number, so it's absolutely enormous. And it's the largest so-called simple group, provable, I mean, there's a, one of the, uh, oh God, one of the f most famous intellectual achievements of humanity, I mean, it's, it's, it's as big as that was uh, completed uh, early 80s. Well, in a sense, it's still not completed because the, the proof that uh, of all, all the possible simple groups uh, uh, were known by around late, late 70s or so. And a famous proof that took tens of thousands of pages in journals. Uh, it involved the collaboration of several hundred research pure mathematicians. So it was a huge effort. And now uh, pure mathematicians are trying to simplify the proof to get it down from tens of thousands to about more or less say 5,000 pages long of proof is such that you could put the entire proof in a series of paper volumes on your book, you know, on one book shelf. Um, in fact, I why you can't see that. Yeah. Here, here are two of, two of those, those volumes of the simplified proofs and hopes to get down to about 5,000 5, pages. Now, so what? Why, why is this important? Well, there are already strong hints that this monster group is intimately connected with string theory. In fact, uh, a guy called uh, Borchards, B-O-R-C-H-E-R-D-S, Borchards, has already won the Fields Medal. That's sort of, uh, sort of like the Nobel Prize. Um, anyway, he got, he got the Fields Medal for um, linking very closely, you know, mathematically, the monster group, you know, this huge, this humongous group with uh, order 10 to the power 50 or so, to string theory, to 26 dimensional string theory. And people, a lot of uh, pure mathematicians and uh, mathematical physicists, in fact they're virtually the same thing nowadays, 
uh, at, at the top levels, uh, they suspect very strongly that uh, the monster, the monster group, is going to play uh, a very important role in future mathematical physics. So if you're a deist, as I think I said once before, if you're a deist and you think that uh, the universe is designed by some godlike, uh, hyper-intelligent creature, that, that creature, that designer, that deity, uh, probably has used the monster group to design aspects of the universe. Uh, well, if you're a deist, that's the sort of thing that uh, you, you may suspect. And to be honest, I'm very partial to deism. I, I won't commit myself saying that I'm definitely a deist, because uh, you know, I have doubts, but I'm suspicious. I'm very suspicious the universe is designed, and that's the mathematician and the physicist, particularly the physicist, in me talking. Okay? So, uh, I will, you know, what's the point of saying all this? I will take you uh, to these highest levels. Now, I won't be giving you 5,000 pages of proof. Uh, I'll be summarizing and simplifying, obviously. Um, you know, there are books on, on this topic, so I can, you know, I can give you what the book is saying. And of course, the book to, to be of that kind of length obviously has to simplify. So I can, I can present to you that simplification. So if you too share my fascination, because that's what it is, in the possibility that uh, these simple groups, and <laughs> simple in the technical sense, right? They're not, they're not simple at all in, this, in the sense of uh, easy to understand. Uh, they are highly advanced uh, mathematics. But uh, the so-called finite simple groups, as a technical term, very probably play a vital role in future mathematical physics, in, in describing the world. Okay? Uh, we already, already have strong hints. And uh, the guy Borchards, the guy who did it, uh, got the Fields Medal for, for linking the monster group with a 26-dimensional string theory. Uh, so saying this, repeating myself a little for reinforcement. Okay. Uh, so, the, this concept I want to introduce to you, it's called the uh, centralizer. Cen centralizer. And it's written as Z. This, this, this is its symbol. <coughs> now, uh, why am I talking about simple groups and physics and all that stuff? Because uh, this concept of centralizer plays a very important role in a lot of the proofs at, at higher level, like PhD 1, PhD 2, finite simple group theory. Right? So if you're, if you're interested in this stuff, if you, if you really like group theory and you're an algebraist or, or you just have a strong interest in it, just curious, and you, you want to take uh, finite group theory to higher levels, you know, well, well beyond master's level, say, uh, then you will see this concept, this idea, uh, this uh, mathematical entity called a centralizer, you'll see it cropping up again and again. It, uh, it, it's a very useful concept in higher finite group theory. Okay, so what is it? Well, um, it's represented by Z. Now, don't be fooled, this is no longer the set of uh, integers. Yeah, it's, a, it's the same letter, capital Z, but um, the reason it's Z is because it comes from the German word. If, if you're the first person to invent a concept, uh, you get to label it, right? So uh, the letter Z uh, is the first letter of the German, because uh, some German guy invented it, I assume, uh, of the German word central. C-E-N-T-R-A-L. Central. You know, I speak German. Okay. Central just means uh, the center or the middle. Okay. So um, now, how, let's 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 define it. So, z of g. Now, what's little little g here is just uh, an arbitrary member of a group. So, little, little g here is just a member, just any old member of a group. Okay. Now, Z of G, by definition, so I put three bars there, by definition, 
is the set of elements belonging to G such that uh, xg equals gx. That's all it is. Right? So, so, so what are you doing? Well, imagine, like, take, here's, here's your group G. I'm, I'm presenting it visually sort of, so you can get it more intuitively if you have a more visual type mind rather than an algebraic uh, symbolic type mind. So here's, here's your group G with, with its elements. It's a finite group, right? So, um, you know, the, the unit element A, B, C, D, da, 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 you know, to your, your finite group. Now, pick, pick arbitrarily one of those elements and call it little g. Right? That's, that's just, this is just an element of your group. Okay, so, so here's your little g here. And here, here are all your other members of the group. Now, take your g and take your first element of the group and see if it commutes. So if, if, you, if you choose A, see if AG equals GA. If it does, that element A goes into this set. Okay? So the centralizer is a set. It's just a set of those um, elements that commute with your, with your G. Okay? So, so again, you know, here's, here's your element, the, the elements of your set, and here's, here's your G. Now uh, take your G and see if it commutes. You know, x g equals g x see if it commutes with the second one if it does put that second one in the set and so on until until you've done all the elements of the group okay so what you're doing this set here is a collection of all those elements in the set that commute with your g okay you got you got the concept so uh, so so your centralizer here is just this. Okay? Now here's the punchline. That centralizer, that that set of the elements that commute with G, is this arbitrary element of your set of, of your group, big G. That centralizer, that, that Z of G, is a subgroup. So, so a centralizer 